So we're going we're to jump straight back now into our Navigating Life series. Next week's our last week, so, so get it while it's hot. Okay, and then you can go get it while it's in the warming drawer on YouTube. Okay? <laughs> you get seconds. It's good to listen to some of this stuff two, three, four, five times until it drops in. We want stuff to drop into our spirits, not just touch our minds for a moment. You don't, that's why it says, I, David said, I will meditate on your word day and night. So that tells me that it's not just a knowledge thing. It's not just me checking the box. I need to meditate on it. Like, full disclosure, I lay on my bedroom floor. I've got a pretty large bedroom. I lay on my bedroom floor on one of those back roller things and just listen to the book of Romans this morning, the whole book of Romans. I'm just looking at the ceiling, just contemplating the word of God. And that might sound bizarre, but I need to force myself to meditate on it. I need to force myself to do more than just read it. I need to contemplate, meditate, check my life against what it's saying. Invite it into the deep places of my heart, not just skim through the words. So so we need to make sure that we're meditating on good, sound teaching so that it doesn't just educate us, it transforms our mind. Are, Are you with me? We can't be educated Christians. There's too many educated Christians out there that do nothing with their knowledge. We need to be discipled by the word, which brings us into our topic today, which is going to be plugging into discipleship. Yeah. Plugging into discipleship. See, the reason that we're going through this series is we want to give you pillars and tools that you can build into your life to have a successful walk of faith. Amen? Yeah. So, so, There's a scripture that I want to read that really parallels our generation today, and honestly, in a lot of the church today, extremely well. And it is found in the book of Judges, chapter 17 and verse 6. I'm going to read from the New King James. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See, That really parallels our generation so well today. Comments that I come across were, I thought, I assumed, I think, I did, I wanted to, right? Like, that's become very commonplace. I thought, I assumed, because just do it, right? We started getting told when we were kids that Nike said, just whatever you want to do, just do it. And that's turned into a mantra of if it feels good to your soul, then it must be God. If it feels right to your mind, how dare anyone challenge that? Hello? You see, we live in a culture in the world that is so potent. Like You could say that this scripture defines the religion of the world today. There was no king, there's no absolute, and so everyone is creating their own truth. Everyone is creating their own absolutes, Actually, they're erasing most of them. There are no absolutes. Do whatever you want, right? Be your own God, in essence. That's what, that's what Lucifer sold Eve. Be your own God. That's the other version of what he said, just be your own God, right? So everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, that creates chaos because there's no benchmark of truth. There's no uniformity of culture. It becomes a kingdom of orphans. Think about that. If I feel threatened, I get triggered. If I want it, I take it. If I don't feel comfortable with it, I back away. See, there is no benchmark coming down from a king. There's no laws of the land There's no community guidelines. There's nothing. There's everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. Make sense? So we need to talk about this because just because the world looks like this today, has the kingdom of heaven followed the track of the degeneration of earthly culture? Or has it remained the same? It's remained the same. So the kingdom of heaven has the same standards as it did that Jesus emulated. The kingdom of heaven has the same culture 
as it's always had, because God himself said, I am the Lord God, saying yesterday, today, and forever. I do not change. So God, while he will relate to different seasons on the earth, his standards won't. His standards of truth and holiness always stay the same. Now, when a culture in secular society, which has a huge influence on the flavor of the church, goes far away from what heaven looks like, heaven's culture starts to look like extremism. Because it is in relation to where everything's fallen. But the reality is, is that the kingdom of heaven hasn't changed. You might have grown up being allowed to do whatever you want. You might have been a latchkey kid. But God's not a latchkey dad. Hello, are you tracking this? See, this is where we have to tackle the orphan culture that's crept into the church that says, I'll do whatever I want. Don't you dare say nothing. Because actually God's going to say something. And most of the time, you can't hear his voice and he's using people. Hello. So, real quickly, I'm going to race through a scripture that I've quoted a lot in the last couple of years. So, I'm going to to skim it real quick, although not taking away from its importance. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. This is Jesus, his departing statement. All nations, another word for that is all people groups, Or all men is another translation. Go and make disciples of all men, all people groups, all nations. That's pretty comprehensive. Can we agree with that? Go and make disciples of all, let's just say people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, he's talking about himself, and the Holy Spirit, which was still in, he was still inbound. Right? Pastor Bex did an amazing uh, job of that a couple of weeks ago. Wasn't that awesome? Teaching them, listen to this teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. Jesus wasn't leading people, just accepting people for where they were at. Don't you judge me. Don't you judge my decisions. Don't you tell me what to do. Jesus was there to teach, this is the kingdom. This is the way we honor people in the kingdom, This is the way we honor God in the kingdom. This is the way we conduct ourselves in the kingdom. This is what maturity, character, integrity, mission focus. This is what the father sees is that he's looking for all his kids back and you need to come into maturity so that you can function in your gifts and callings to partner with that. You can't go do it the way you thought. Hello. You can't represent God the way you've always been. And so the problem with that is that most of us, if not all of us, have grown up very different. So who's right? None of us. God's right. Figure that out. So what you have to say to yourself right now is there is a lot of things that I'm very wrong about. I thought I was right, but God's right. And I need to find out what his right is. Just accept me, bro. Don't judge me. Just leave me alone. I'm figuring out my own journey, my own truth. Mm -mm. That is mimicking the Luciferian culture that is influencing the planet. Don't judge me. Everyone's a god. They can all make their way. Now, that's called compromise, and that's called assimilation. That's called reflecting hell, not representing heaven. So, Let's look at this here. Jesus has, Jesus has been on the earth for 33 years. He didn't come into ministry when he was five. You seen any of them weird child preachers that people have tried to create, those little icons? Dude, that is some Chucky freak show stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about? Them little Southern Baptist little five-year-olds that have been taught to... to you seen that stuff on, on TV? That is freaky. I mean, it's messed up the kid for sure. If you haven't, just go YouTube, Child Preacher is disturbing. Because you see that actually, and like, I'm not taking away from, there might be, might be some moments that that could have place. But the problem is a five-year-old ain't learned to pay the bills yet. Five-year-old is having tantrums because they want Chick-fil-A and mum and dad are buying McDonald's. 
Okay, so a five-year-old hasn't learned to submit themselves in obedience to the covering they have. They've just been given knowledge and they're repeating it. This is an orphan dressed up to look like a son in the church. And it comes in all ages. Okay, you catching this? See, there's a benchmark that we need to come in line with, not hold our ground and say, this is how I'm doing it. Suck it up, bud. Hello? Ooh. See, this is the, this, I saved this one till last because I'm just really enjoying this series. I just knew I was called. And you are. Watch this. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. That doesn't just mean going into water. That means immersing them into the relational culture of obedience to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Relational culture of obedience. Okay. Teaching them to observe or obey all the things that I've taught you. So Jesus took all these different people, some were fishermen, some were, you know, uh, tax guys, some were lawyers, there was even a physician in there. He brought all these different people in on purpose. Is there different, different people in this room? Yes, on purpose. And each of us have different viewpoints and professions and sports that we like, but there is actually only one plumb line of heaven. And we all need to come in line with that. Right? I'm not talking cult culture. I'm talking kingdom culture. It just is so extreme that it becomes scary and it looks like control to someone that's used to doing whatever they want when actually it's perfect alignment. Hello? Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and I am with you even to the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus is saying... Number one, go and get everyone saved that you can. Disciple them. What does discipleship look like? Baptizing them into relationship with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. It's not an option. It's a command. So you're teaching people to obey the culture of God. Because it actually goes better for you when you obey God's culture than when you figure it out on your own. Okay. Who's ever behaved like a devil and it's gone well? Like, please, don't, that's not, don't raise your hand. I know the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but let's talk the big, let's zoom out here on the chart and look at the big picture. Hello. Okay. So that is, that is what Jesus said, discipleship. So I, I want to I say something here that re- really needs to be registered because you can listen to this scripture a thousand times and not understand the heart behind what Jesus was saying. Jesus said, go into all the world. Go to every person that you can find that will get on board with us, right? All men. So when we hear things like discipleship, we think that's just for leaders and aspiring leaders and ministers and people that feel called of God. Actually, it's for every single believer. Hello? Every, if you are part of the family, if you're part of this house, we're a discipleship house. Okay, because we believe that the kingdom looks more than just a membership to a local club. And it looks like a group of people being discipled in the way of the kingdom. This is the way. (laughs) Right? It looks like people being discipled, tutored, mentored, trained, equipped, apprenticed into the culture of the kingdom the values of the kingdom, the principles and the character of the kingdom, and the mission of the kingdom. Discipleship has to be more than just the local church's core values. He, we're literally saying, Jesus is literally saying, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's not baptizing them into local church culture. It's baptizing people into the kingdom culture. We are a kingdom discipleship house. Hello. We're not part of some franchise church group that has, you know, conference meetings that just everyone comes together and talks about how big a church they've got. No, we are looking to disciple people so that we have a house full of people that are on fire and growing in maturity to God. Amen. Amen. I wrote this down. Discipleship is more than culture. 
It is the vehicle for kingdom longevity. Discipleship is how we create legacy. Hello. So discipleship ensures... See, when I was about seven years old, I went to London. I was in England for six months. My, my dad had a special scholarship, and we, he was there. And so we would, every weekend, we would go and look at all these amazing places with phenomenal heritage in England. And I remember going to St. Paul's. You guys heard of St. Paul's Cathedral? Famous paintings all on the ceilings and all that kind of stuff. And I just remember being seven years old. Like, when you're seven years old, you're like, this is the biggest place I've been in my whole life. Yeah, that's because you're seven. You were seven. Your whole life is seven years old. Right? But I remember having this moment at seven years old where I was looking at this massive cathedral, and the person giving us a tour was saying that it literally took four generations, four generations to build this structure. Now today, we could probably build that with modern technology in a couple of years, with high-level high detail, probably a couple of years, maybe, maybe a year and a half. Four generations. So what that looked like was great-great-granddad was a master carpenter or a master stonecutter. And he worked for 40-something years cutting stone and laying foundation. He never saw the dome. He never saw the walls. He just was in the ground putting rocks and concrete and building foundation. And he had a son in the course of his life, maybe two. And those sons didn't go off to university to become aspiring lawyers and actors, creating all kinds of hundreds of thousands of dollars of student loans. They came to work with dad, and they worked alongside dad as an apprentice. What are you doing on your first day? I've got some carpenters, I've got some, who's some tradespeople in the house, okay? What are you doing on your first day? You're sweeping the floor, son. I love you. Sweep the floor. Listen, when I turned up as an apprentice, because I'm an apprentice carpenter, I did two apprenticeships. I did boat shipbuilding and uh, house and commercial construction. I did both of those. And so I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of experience crafting with my hands. And, you know, when I turned up as a brand new, can you imagine, like 16, 17-year-old me? <laughs> it was a trip. But anyways, I turned up, and see, the thing is, is that you got this brand new leather apron, and you got some tools, and you are just, you're ravishing Rick Rude. You just rolled up, and you are so bad to the bone. You got all the tools, all the gifts, all the strength of your youth, and you got something to offer. And you get to the job, and this old, wise craftsman looks at you, and he goes, put all that down and pick up the broom. You're going to be sweeping the floor today. And you are just insulted. <laughs> How dare you demean my great potential? I have so much destiny. Sweep the floor. You'll be doing that for the next six months. Just watch everyone and learn. You are going to learn on the end of that broom. How demeaning. Don't they know that I am a great one in the making? Right? I'm right, right? That's how you do it. And so you think you show up with everything to offer, and you actually don't even know how to find. I remember one of my bosses, he was like, go get me, because we have, we have millimeters instead of inches in New Zealand. And he's like, go get me a 90 mil nail. And I'm standing there in front of his nail box, and there's like 20,000 different nail sizes. And I've got like, I'm pulling out a tape measure and measuring like what size of the nail it is and I go get it from him he goes oh no not that one this one it's not shiny it's dull and da, 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 da. and I'm just like I'm freaked out so anytime he's asking me to get him a nail and I'm taking 20 minutes on a job that takes 30 seconds see I don't re I'm waking up to the fact that while I have talent I have no skills and I have no experience and it takes me some time to realize that the people around me are actually masters and I am a blank canvas that needs to learn from the ground up. I might feel important wearing my belt. I might even feel special with little Robocop hammer thing, you know. Oh, trust me. 
right? <laughs> but then you start realizing how little you know. And, you know, for me, I, I think normally an apprenticeship takes four years, and I completed mine in two and a half years, my carpentry apprenticeship. And when I completed my apprenticeship, you know, I did some school sections, you know, some units, and uh, I don't know if that's what you call them here, but we did units where you go and do all of the, all of the tech and the, the theory stuff, and then you're working, building houses out in the field with your employer at the same time, and it's kind of in and out. And so I did, I did, I did everything in two and a half years. I rock started, right? I was building one and a half million dollar homes for my boss. I was leading crews at the age of 17, 18, sorry, 18, 19 years old. So I accelerated, I did well. But what happens is, is that when you finish your apprenticeship and you go out on your own, you start to realize that the learning has only just begun. And just because you're qualified, don't mean you're experienced. And when you go out on your own, you realize you need your tutors even more than you did when you thought you were an apprentice. Am I right? That's exactly how it is. And see, so the problem is, is that we, we have this, there is no king in Israel and everyone does what's right in their own eyes. And then we turn up to do things where it's like, I'm ready, I've got potential, let me at him. And someone's just like, slow down. What do you mean? Is this church doesn't raise people up. Hold on, cowboy. Put that little hammer spin on. (laughs) Put your chisel away and your little box cutter knife, right? This is going to be a journey. And the person you think is holding you back is actually the person wanting to make a master craftsman out of you. They're just far more seasoned and far wiser. And they actually have your best interest at heart but they're not going to throw you to the wolves and and let you get an inflated ego and destroy your calling. Zeal believes that discipleship is limitation and control. Wisdom and experience values the mistakes and the mess that will help me avoid. Someone catching this? (laughs) Okay, so Mark chapter 1, Gospel of Mark chapter 1, verse 16. Some of you watching online or some of you in this room right now, you might have come from a completely different church culture. My my question is, I have a few questions today that I want to ask. Why do you come from a completely different culture? Because the kingdom of heaven only has one. And so sometimes we've grown up in franchise-type formulas that only look after what looks like the talented in the room. And everyone else is just there to keep the seat warm on Sunday. But we just read Matthew 18, sorry, Matthew 28, that said, go into all the world and make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've taught you, right? So there's limitations on that because not actually everyone is able to be discipled. We're going to get to that in a minute. Or not, not everyone is ready to be discipled now. Matthew, sorry, Mark chapter 1, verse 16. As he walked, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. What is he saying? Because just just pause for a second. In that culture, in that time, in, in Israel, it was essentially the purpose of a young man to have a master or a experienced, seasoned individual like a rabbi take that five-year-old or ten-year-old boy under his wing. Actually, it was closer to between five and seven because they started working a lot earlier back then, right? They didn't have college degrees. 
and that young boy would come an apprentice under that man, whether it was in the temple or whether it was out in the, in, in the, in the boat, there was a heart because in that culture they understood that my destiny is bound up in the wisdom of a father. My destiny and how I get there is in the tutoring, mentoring, and fathering or mothering for women of a seasoned master. I don't want just anybody. I want someone that can call me higher. Hello. So Jesus is making that exact statement. It's just, it's just been translated through the King James. He is making that statement, come follow me, is the statement that a rabbi or a lawyer or some really important person would say to a young boy, come follow me and I will make you look like me. I will teach you what I have. Now, how you, how you steward that will determine whether you make it to the other end. We have a problem in America called groupie culture that we believe if we can get close, we can have power. Judas got close, but he didn't have enough power to do what was right. So it's the heart of stewardship, not the level of proximity. I'm going to get to that in a little bit later in my message, but let's watch this. He said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So what he was saying was, you're not a fisher of men yet, but I see your potential. You need to follow me and apprentice with me, and I will turn you into, transform you, fashion you into your true purpose, your heavenly calling. I will make you become fishers of men. So Jesus was already walking. He'd been a carpenter serving Joseph for many, many years. He was now 30 years old. And his season of preparation was now mature. See, if I see a baby trying to disciple another baby, I have concerns. If someone's going to disciple someone, I want it to be a person that is seasoned and healthy and, and here's another one, and has actually been authentically discipled themselves. Not just someone that abused their favor to get into a position of notoriety so that other people would see them as a wise one, but someone that actually, like my apprenticeship, even after I graduated, I valued even more the wisdom of the seasoned. I didn't disconnect myself because now I got it from here, Pops. I pulled into it even more, so much so that when I had a problem on a project or when I was planning a project, I would call some of my mentors and say, hey, I'm sending you this in an email because we didn't do snaps snaps on phones back then. I mean, you know, that was like 16 pixels on the screen. That was it. (laughs) Right? That was messed up. So, (laughs) yeah, it's basically the dark ages. So... But I would get on the phone with them or I would go to their project and I'd pull the plans out and I would say, this is a challenge. These roof angles don't make sense. Can you help me? Can you show me how you brought this together? And they'd be like, oh, yeah, I got this. I've encountered this a thousand times. And I was like, really? Because I thought this was whole project was falling apart. It was my first time. They're like, oh, yeah, don't even sweat it. This is how you do it. And so I'm pulling on them. But what I'm also doing is I'm honoring who they are in my life by including them in my process. Does that make sense? Come with me, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It's the journey next to someone. It's the journey of watching someone, serving someone. And see, if we, if we zoom back out to the culture that we are surrounded by, serving someone sounds like slavery. Don't you human traffic me? How dare you tell me how to do something? You see, there is so much ego and so much independent arrogance in our culture that if you were going to be discipled, you were going to have to fight that viciously, ferociously, because it is so established that it feels like personality. It feels like our defense mechanism. 
when actually it's a different culture that's infiltrated our minds. Are you catching this? Because God's plan is for everybody in this room to be discipled, everyone watching online to be discipled. Right? Okay. I'm writing a book on this right now. I just wrote another chapter this last week. I'm really excited about it. As soon as I get it done, I want us to do a study as a church through it because it will help us as a house grow. And it will help you to find how to connect with fathers and mothers. It will help you to posture yourself. It will help you to understand how do I relate to these people. Because so many of us have just got an independent spirit. We do whatever we want and we just come up for permission. There's a whole chapter on permission in this book. See, we just, just let me do what I want. Samuel comes into town and Saul's disobeyed God. He hasn't followed kingdom culture. And Saul is more interested in just, make, just bless me, make this look good, rather than what do I do right. That's the culture we're at war with here. We're, we're wanting to do it right so that we walk in heaven's blessing, not just getting permission. Does that make sense? So, what makes, now I'm, I'm going to let you have a little sneak peek into something I've been, been writing recently, is that alright? What makes the difference between a son or a daughter that becomes a disciple, because I guarantee you if I sat down with every person in the room and I had you all by yourself for a minute, each one of you would give a different definition of what you thought discipleship was. So therefore, what we really need to figure out is what does God call discipleship? Not what I think discipleship is. And then how do I connect myself and partner and even covenant with kingdom discipleship? All right? Why do some, let's just use the scriptures for a second. Why do some disciples go on to do great things and some disciples are never heard of again? I'll tell you why. Because of their level of proximity. And I want to talk to you about that for a second. Let's talk about the different groups that had different levels of proximity to Jesus. And by the way, as a caveat, each level of proximity that you get to have will determine what's really in your heart. Like, for instance, if you want to find out how someone's doing, watch them when they get more money. Because money magnifies what's in your heart. You ever seen someone just come into a whole bunch of money and it's like, what's wrong with you? When someone gets a promotion or a new season or more money and all of a sudden they start behaving like, I don't recognize you, what's going on? It's not that they changed, it's just that the circumstances magnified who they really were. Okay, so we see the 5,000 people, the 5,000 men, it says it noted 5,000 men. So I have to say there's probably fifteen to 20,000 women, children and men. They were out following Jesus for three days. It actually happened twice if you read the scriptures. And Jesus, on this occasion, he fed them loaves and fishes, right? So we know that there was 5,000 people at least, so, sorry, 15,000 people at least that were out following Jesus, listening to his teachings. They were loving what he was saying because it was resonating and making sense in truth. This group, represents the masses of churchgoers. See, they're not down in the brothels. They're actually listening to truth. They're close enough to hear what God's saying, but they're also far enough away that when he says something challenging, if you, and another time he said, if you want to go further, you've got to eat my body and drink my blood. They're close enough to hear what he's saying and feel like, well, I go to church. That's my culture. We're part of the kingdom. They're close enough to see his eyes and hear his passion and feel the spirit when he's teaching, but they're far enough away to control how much that truth holds them accountable. They're far enough away to be able to disconnect the minute it isn't convenient anymore. See, these people would call themselves disciples, but are they really disciples? Are they people that have just got conditional proximity? while they're eating loaves and fishes. But the second a cost arrives, arises, these people unplug. Then we have a closer group called the 500. 
These 500 were the people that were with Jesus and watched him ascend up into the heavens. They witnessed notable miracles, signs and wonders. They, they literally saw Jesus step onto a little cloud conveyor and... Whoop. But then two months later, there was only 120 left. Why? Where did the other 380 go? Hello? You guys understand the difference between Jesus ascending, 500 seeing him, and 120 being in the upper room? Where did the other 380 go? See, every time you get closer, there's a filtering process, whether you're going to stay in or not. There's a challenge on the price of your heart. There's a challenge on the price of your soul. Are you actually going to step up to the requirements? Because every time I get a little closer, it's going to cost me a little more. And, and right now I'm talking about Jesus, but this parallels perfectly into human discipling because we just read, go and make disciples of all men. He's speaking to people. Oh, I don't need discipleship. I've got the Holy Ghost. Um, then why did Jesus say make disciples of all men? And why did Jesus say that he was going to make people into disciples, not that he was anointing them as disciples, as, as fishermen, sorry. See, we think if we go to a prayer line and get some oil on our head, well, now you are released, my child. Go into the world and establish the kingdom. Be blessed. Right? No, it's going to take... Just because you got the tool belt don't mean that you got the skills and the wisdom and the longevity. It don't mean that you've got the character. It means you need someone in your life. Look, here's the deal. You might say, well, Pastor Andrew, you're a pastor now. Dude, I need, dude and dudettes, I need, I need the people in my life more now that speak into my life than I did when I wasn't doing any ministry. That's the difference between what I'm choosing to call kingdom discipleship, and what a lot of people are just looking for permission. I see it as a lifestyle. I will purposely submit myself to authority to make sure that I'm under authority and someone has a voice in my life. Hello? Not just me popping up and saying, hey, I'm going to do this. What do you think? Sorry, hey, I'm going to do this. Cool. Cool. Instead of, hey, I'm thinking about doing this, what do you think, Pastor Don? What do you think, Brother David? You guys catching this? And I give them a voice. Okay. So, so there's the 500 that become the 120. And they have a powerful moment. They now see tongues of fire, winds, filling of the Holy Spirit. They see 3,000 people saved in one service out of the side of a building. It's amazing, Right? So now I'm going to backtrack a little bit to the 70. See, now it's a smaller group. See, the smaller the group, the more potent the proximity. Can, can I just kick something in the face for a second really well with steel caps and spikes? Just because you listen to it on YouTube don't mean it discipled you. There is a massive difference between acquiring knowledge that you can repeat. Dude, I can train a parrot to repeat information. Don't you establish your value based on what you can repeat. Oh! Did you, hear, did you hear what I just said? See, most people, like I've even been around some pretty big deal people in the last couple of years, and some of the things I've heard them say have disturbed me to the core. Super big name in the prophetic movement, I'm sitting on a panel, and this particular individual goes ahead to tell me that, well, I never met this particular individual, but this particular individual discipled me through a set of tapes. And I just sat back and I'm like, dude, this is, I should not be on this panel. Because tapes can't disciple you, they can teach you. But even the scriptures should have told you that knowledge puffs up. Hello? Your knowledge is not qualification. Yeah, I see your hammer, I see your chisel, I see your brand new apron with no, no damage on it. You ain't got any glue that you wiped off your hands, no silicon from putting in a pipe, and you're just like trying to, right? Am I right, Mike? You're like wiping it on your apron. You're just all pretty in your brand new apron. You ain't got any like, I mean, you come up, look, next time you're up close to me, just look at my fingers. There are scars and cuts and bruises and calluses. See, I don't want to see your shiny sword if you call yourself a leader. I want to see a shield that's dinged up. And I want to see some, 
some swords that have some chinks out of them because you, you made it through some battles with God's help and you're still here. I don't want to see your shiny gift that hasn't been used. Your knowledge, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to belittle anybody, but your knowledge has not caused you to win any battles. I want people to speak into my life that have won battles. Hello. So the 70, check this out, please check this out. The 70 are in a service and they get anointed by Jesus. They're following Jesus in a bigger group. But the 70 have enough proximity where Jesus lines them up and he pairs them up so there's, there's 35 teams of two. Right? Because wisdom says you're not big enough to go on your own. It ain't you and no one else. It's you and Kevin's community. Right? So there's, so there's 35 teams of two and Jesus anoints them and he sends them out to surrounding cities. And they go out to surrounding cities in the name of Jesus and they start casting out demons. They start laying hands and sick people are getting healed. Uh, I think maybe even some dead raisings. Who knows? Right? Even the demons obey us. They come back and they are psyched. These dudes are lit up. They are so pumped because they have power. They have authority. Yeah, and they haven't even been with Jesus a year. They haven't even been discipled for a year, most likely. You tracking here? So they have gifts. And demons are listening to them. Okay? What they actually need when they come back is a master who's grounded to say you're excited about the wrong thing. I'm excited for the fact that you're walking in power. Tick. But that's actually not where our value system is in this kingdom. I'm going to correct you right now and tell you actually that you should be rejoicing about something else. So just because you start walking in power and authority doesn't mean that now you have to kick Papa out and do whatever you want. You actually need the voice of the wise even more. Is someone catching this right now? See, we, we, we are actually a very treacherous society. We get opportunity, we get authority, we get training, we get mentoring, and the second we don't believe we need them anymore, we cut them. Just do whatever I want, make you be happy with it. Or maybe I'll just cut you out of my life altogether. Don't need you anymore. Hello? You guys tracking what I'm saying? This is the culture. Look at the politics. If you want to look at the po- look at Hollywood. Look at the business world. It is psycho. There is no honor. Right? And then you look at the church and you're like, oh yeah, it's kind of leaking in a little bit. A lot. Right? There was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Well, I just got my own ministry. I just do stuff. And da, da, da. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Oh, uh, uh, none of your business. Okay? I won't make it my business. Hello? Go and learn. It will hurt. And you will come back one day and say help. And I will be here. Hello? See, the problem is, is that our zeal is not harnessed by wisdom. And the reality is, is that you don't have enough wisdom when you're young. And I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about young in your spirit. Because you get excited, you are zealous to go after God. Right? And so that's a good thing. Like Paul said, it is a good thing to desire the work or the position of a bishop. But there's a lot, of, lot that's going to have to be qualified for that to take place. It's good that you have a desire to be used in your calling. Yes, we want to feed that. But now we have to talk about discipleship because it's how you're going to get there. And you must be committed to a long period of time and vulnerable relationships to the right person that's going to be able to correct you because discipleship has a root word in the word discipline and discipline in the, in the context of discipleship. Discipleship today, people are looking for, oh, I just love I just love your spirit and I love your heart and you're amazing and your gifts are just so phenomenal. But the problem is, is none of those things I've just said, although we do need affirmation and we do need compliments and we do need encouragement, we need that stuff. The problem is, is none of those things are going to get you closer to to actually being mature. What's going to get you closer to being mature is what someone in a position of leadership can say to you to confront the thing that's holding you back. 
the culture, the stronghold, the character issues, the parts of your life that just... And, and look, I'm not taking away from Holy Spirit. But Jesus literally said, knowing that people don't listen to Holy Spirit a lot of the time, go and make disciples and teach them to come in line and conform to this kingdom. Hello? Someone catching something right now? So the 70 just... We're in a generation where there's been such a demonstration of miracles and signs and wonders that people think that that is somehow a level of ascension. Dude, there's people that were just with Jesus for a little bit and they're now casting out demons and Jesus is like not even showing them any cred. We need to change. Please get this. Jesus didn't even go, that's amazing. You guys are just my heroes. He's like, that's great, but... Don't rejoice in that. (laughs) He doesn't believe in me. He's not for me. I'm going to flip and betray him. Who's got 30 pieces? Yeah, but that's actually what happens when people get corrected. They seek out how they can betray. See, if you haven't got a right heart in discipleship, discipleship actually will be your greatest enemy. And you will destroy people around you. Because the second you get corrected, I'm going to talk about that in a second, The second you get corrected, now you'll be seeking out a reason to fight back. Hello? That's the devil's workshop. Praise the Lord. Okay, so the 70 had power, which is good. That's what Jesus wanted. He said, in my name they will cast out demons, they'll speak in other tongues, they'll raise the dead, they'll heal the sick, they will step on deadly things and drink, drink deadly things and they won't be harmed. That is part of who you're supposed to be, but it is not the essence of your maturity. And discipleship is, is there, created by God, to craft maturity and longevity in your life so that you'll make it to the end. Who here wants to get to the point, we all don't know when we're going to die, but when you get to that point, who wants to know in their heart, I ran the race, I fought the fight, I was obedient, I gave what I could to God. Who, that, that's me. I want that to be me. So how do I get there? Discipleship will, and, and like, there's a whole book that's it's like more than two times bigger than anything I've written, and it really isn't something I can summarize in one service. But discipleship, if it's stewarded well, even if there's awkwardness, like Peter cutting people's ears off and lying and cussing and running away, right? Even if there's that, which there's room for that. There is room for that, but there's not room for that to be the normal. Hello? Even if that's there, if you can get around someone that becomes a teacher, someone that is a father or a mother in your life, not multiple fathers, so you've got options, That's the other Orange County stronghold. Well, I've got all these different opinions. Yeah, now you're confused. Just choose one. Actually, they're going to choose you because fathers create sons. Sons don't create fathers. Mothers make daughters. Daughters don't make mothers. You're going to disciple me, am I? I don't know about that. Let's find out. Because every disciple that Jesus had were ones that the Father gave him, not ones he picked himself. Hello? Hello? If I didn't have those wise carpenters, I would have butchered so many house builders, house buildings that I was, I was constructing. And it could have cost me thousands of dollars in materials and embarrassment and upset customers. But the time and the money that those guys saved me by giving me the advice on how to fix these intricate strategic problems accelerated me so I could build more houses in a shorter period of time. The same is true in your walk with God. If you have and steward and obey, because it's one thing to hear God, right? You know, don't just be a hearer, but be a doer of the word. Where do you think that came from? God pouring out truth into people and people doing nothing with the truth. Hello? So God doesn't want you just to be around discipleship. He wants you to implement it in your life. And actually, if someone's taking out the time to give you counsel, even if it's uncomfortable, confrontational, that you do something to change. Because I can tell you right now from experience, if I'm telling someone something and they're not changing, my voice is stopping. And I'm not going to sit back and watch. 
I'm going to sit back and watch because in a minute, pain will be a much louder teacher than me. That's real. And, and, and here's what a discipler or a father will be trying to do. If you can just listen to me and make this decision or do this differently, I did it wrong and it cost me five years of delay. But if you listen to me, I can pull the gold out of my scars and I can give you the gift that I didn't have. And I can help you get there faster. It might look like, most probably, the longer, humbler, and more difficult way. It might look like very confrontational or not what you would choose. But someone that's been down the road is going to help me. If I'm going to go as a hunter, if I'm going to recreationally go into an area of the mountains that I've never hunted before, guess what I'm looking for? Someone that's hunted there before. What is the terrain like? Is there water supply somewhere? Because in a minute, I'm going to run out of water. Can you point me on the map where I can go find water? That happened to me once. My friend had told me where there's this tiny little spring. And I mean a little spring like this. And you had to pull moss away. This is in the middle of nowhere in New Zealand. It's above the clouds. There's clouds literally coming like, like water on the beach below me. And I've run out of water. But he's given me a pinpoint on the map where I can find this tiny, insignificant spring. I had to walk around this one area for an hour until I found it, and I was starting to get very concerned, to the point where you're like squeezing out moss into your mouth to make it wet, okay? But if I didn't have the wisdom of my seasoned friend, would I be here? Hello? See, so I need someone that's down the road, that's been there before, because I'm confident. I got my new builder's apron. I am so optimistic and so talented, says the voice of arrogant, uneducated pride. See, instead of submitting myself to the wisdom of those that have been there, I'm going to boldly go where no man's gone before. <laughs> Beam me up, right? And a train wreck's going to happen. And yeah, you might get wiser as a result, but you're going to hurt people and you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to delay yourself and when you're 60, 70, 80 years old, will you be where you're supposed to have been or will have that mistake slowed you getting there? And maybe you're only able to achieve 60% of your potential instead of 80%. Are someone tracking this? Discipleship is designed to get you there. It just looks like the low and the slow road. So then there's the 12. The 12 have proximity with Jesus. They go and they track with him. They walk through fields, eat, eat grain on the Lord's day. They hang out. They, they get Airbnbs. They, they have bread and wine. They go out hanging in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the difference is, is that even though Peter was awkward, Judas was stealth. And he abused his favor and he was with them, but he wasn't. He was with Jesus, but he believed different DNA. You can sneak your way into the core leadership team. You can sneak your way right up into next to Peter, James, and John and look like when you're walking through town and there's thousands following and you're with Jesus and like, yeah, I'm leveraging myself into a high-level position here, people. See, that's what Judas was. Judas was a sleeper agent because he loved the excess of proximity, but he hated the accountability and the vulnerability. And so he stayed stubbornly who he always was. Yet he learned the language to operate around to the point where he'd be trusted with the money box. Every level of proximity will filter you. Normally, what you do with correction will start to be the trigger of that. Whether you stay in or you don't make it in that level of proximity. Now, then you've got the three. Peter, James, and John. They're the guys that at certain times when Jairus' daughter was, was dead, remember that, Jairus' daughter was dead? Jesus doesn't bring the other disciples that are his core inner team. He just brings those three. Why? Because they were closer to his heart. They had postured themselves with more honor. They had relationally connected with him. Well, that's Jesus' job. No, it was theirs. It was their job. 
they, they, Jesus' job was to open the door and give them access. What they did once they were in the room was completely up to them. Are you catching this? And so then, you know, the, the, the Mount of Transfiguration where Elijah and Moses appear, and there's this, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, there's this amazing supernatural manifestation, right? Moses and Elijah are literally glowing and talking to Jesus, and there is like this white light everywhere, and Peter is freaking out of his mind. Okay? Why were they invited to experience that? Because they had deeper intimacy with the person of Jesus, not just his knowledge. A discipler is not some college professor, university professor that stands at the front of a room and projects information. It's a person that you connect with at the heart level, but never become, now we're going to talk about something else, but never become familiar. Never become to the point where it's just, we're bros. We are bros. Judas saw Jesus as a bro. You have to catch this. Judas saw Jesus as a brother, not a father. That's why he did what he did. Because actually, Judas was actually more looking for his own establishing of his ministry. Because he came from the same tribe as Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Judas was probably a very smart individual. That's why he was the one with the money box. He was smart. He was sharp. So he started getting familiar, and then out of familiarity, he became critical, and out of criticism, he then began to conspire. And here's why. We, knew, we know that Judas was a thief. Judas stole on a regular basis. Can we all agree on that? The Bible says it very clearly. When, when, the woman, when Mary broke the alabaster box and was pouring out the oil and weeping and anointing Jesus' feet with her hair, Judas pipes up and he's like, this is disgusting. This is bad. This is terrible. I am wanting to object at the board meeting. This should have been sold and given to the poor. How dare this ex-prostitute do this to Jesus? And Jesus so graciously, so delicately, he's like, no, what this woman has done is actually beautiful and it's sacred to me. And anywhere the gospel is taught about, I, it's going to be talked. This, this act is going to be talked about. Right? Now, to everyone else, Jesus was just like saying, no, this is, this is a good thing. But to Judas, Judas was critical. Judas wasn't bringing a good idea. Judas was critical. And because he was critical, Jesus' objection was actually a threat. And it was a rebuke. It was a correction that he was not willing to endure. And then you can literally read the next passage, and it says, and from this point, Judas sought how he may betray Jesus. So correction qualified Judas not staying in the 12. How you steward correction and discipleship actually will determine if you become someone that goes the distance or someone that becomes a casualty. Hello? Correction is not there to oppress you. Correction is actually there to help you see that there's something in you that shouldn't be there and it's holding you back. Like, anyone ever been on those, those morning balloon rides, those hot air balloon rides? Has anyone ever done that? Okay, we've got some people. They've got those weights on the side of those baskets, right? The only reason that that thing takes off is because you disconnect from the weights. So, so correction is like a knife put in your hand, but you've got to cut the rope to disconnect the weight. Because that, dis, that, that dysfunction in your life that's being confronted is holding you down. But then when the correction comes, well, how dare you say that about me? That hurt my feelings. Yeah, that's because your feelings weren't a part of this equation. Truth is a part of this equation, and it has to be embraced if you're going to grow. People get into discipleship because they want the proximity and affirmation of leaders. But true discipleship is actually there to help you, encourage you, walk you through pain and wounds, but also correct you so that you can become everything that you're not by letting go of everything that you're not supposed to be. Hello? Someone catching this? Watch this. Proximity. Lazarus was a great friend of Jesus. He was the, he was the brother of Martha and Mary. You catching this? But he wasn't with Jesus. 
Peter wasn't a family friend, but he was. So it's not about, I know Jesus. See, if Peter had a pressed in, sorry, if Lazarus had a pressed in, I guarantee you he could have been one of the disciples. But he was so close, because they were family friends, that he was so familiar, most likely. A little bit of speculation, but, cat, but walk with me here for a second. Someone not walking in that much power, why wasn't Lazarus there the whole time? But when, Jesus di- when, Peter, when Lazarus died, Jesus came and we know the rest, right? Peter was given the opportunity and yet he chased and left his nets and followed Jesus. And he, he was awkward and wobbled along the way. That, see, this is where... In our world, we want everything to be perfect and look perfect and just be that perfect little American dream. It's not. If you truly want to be discipled, it has to look like a derobing. And I don't mean that in a very crass way. Because we are masters of dressing up with our makeup and our little outfits so that we can portray who the world thinks, who we think the world wants to see. You guys, I said it before, I'm going to say it again. Some of their makeup tutorials... Dude, I watched this makeup tutorial. I don't know how it got on my phone, but it was on my phone. (laughs) And please hear me when I say this, because I'm speaking very compassionately, and I'm not trying to make anyone feel uncomfortable. There was this old lady that looked like a raisin. Her face was so wrinkled up, and she did makeup, and she looked like she was 18 years old. We know how to present as something else. Come on. And see, so that's the culture, although that's a funny example that's the culture that actually, that really looks, that, that portrays the culture we're in very well. Very well. See, so the problem is, is true discipleship comes close and it asks you to take your robe off. Metaphorically. Please. <laughs> Please. It's only one time in the Bible that was okay, you not living in that time frame. What I mean by that is, is that you become vulnerable and you actually able to, well, I've been living with this sore on my arm for all these years and it's always been there. And anytime anyone bumps my arm, I react. Are you catching me? And, and someone that's a father or a mother will want to get that robe off and dig that infection out and put salve on it. Now that's going to hurt but that's what you need so you don't end up in a trash pile. Discipleship, true discipleship will take trust, seasons of trust, but once it starts coming into maturity, it's able to go after those areas and bring correction. You have to remember this. You have to bind this to your heart. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, for the Lord rebukes every son whom he receives and scourges every son whom he accepts. Correction is kingdom culture. It's not rejection. It's not disqualification. But how we steward it, how we steward correction, will determine whether we make it or not. That's why I said before, there's some people that just can't be discipled. Ever or yet. Depending on what you do. The preparation of the heart is of man, but the answer is of the Lord. Hello, are you catching this? There's different levels. I'm not saying that someone can't be discipled, period. They might be part of the 5,000, but which of the 5,000 did anything great to change the kingdom? Tell me one. Tell me one person's name. Of the five, 15,000 up on the side of the hill eating the loaves and the fishes, the five, 15,000 people that were walked away when he was doing the Sermon on the Mount and, and, and the people that heard him say, if you want to eat my body and drink my blood, you, you can't come on unless you do that. Which of those people that got up and walked away changed the world? None of them that we know of. Because it's until you come and sit at the feet of Jesus in a seasoned leader that you'll actually get. Jesus literally said, if you don't let me wash your feet, I can't do this. Are you with me? Because discipleship is not a mastery. Discipleship is being served by the greater served by the more experienced. Now, if you start spinning your wheels and you keep staying in the same place and there's no change, 
Your wheels are just pushing mud all over the people trying to help you. You ever thought about that before? And those people are going to back away because I want you to listen to this. You heard me preach recently. It's like, do not make it a grief for those that lead you to rule over you because it would be bad for you, right? Think about this scripture. Speak, speaking to leaders, fathers, and mothers, do not cast your pearls before the swine. What's the swine? Uncovenanted, unclean. That's Old Testament language. In New Testament language, listen, do not cast your pearls before the swine lest they trample the pearls and then afterwards come and tear you to pieces. What does that mean to leaders? Do not give wisdom to someone that doesn't want it because they will despise the truth and the wisdom that you're trying to bring or the correction. And then because they despise the truth, they have to back that up by tearing you apart. They have to try and defame you, give you a hard time, try and wear you out. See, so the Bible literally commands leaders not to give wisdom to someone that has no intention of doing anything with it. Because ultimately then the leader just gets attacked. Proverbs, rebuke a fool and you will get shame in the end. So you just stop rebuking. You stop correcting. When, when, when a, a fool will see correction as a whipping, whereas a wise man will see correction as an opportunity to grow. It doesn't, it, look, it, it's not pleasant, but it's an invitation to grow. It's, and, and can I just say this? And th this really needs to be thought about because when we hear this, we're always thinking of the context of the disciple, the disciple, the, the student. It's really rough for the father or mother who doesn't need to do anything to have to step into a messy situation and take a massive risk and point something out that doesn't benefit their personal lives. Have you ever thought about that before? That's a massive risk because then now you're getting evil looks in church and people don't show up and next thing there's all kinds of talk happening or people are discrediting you in public. Okay, that's not a good thing for anybody. Are you catching this? So, so if you want to be discipled, show the person that's trying to disciple you that you're going to work well with what, you, what they sow into you. If they sow something into you and you do nothing with it, should they, sow, they, should they try again? Yeah, maybe a few times, but after a while, that's going to stop. And then you're back on your own. And then you're going to say to God, God, you didn't send anyone to help me. I was all alone and I didn't have any." And God's going to be like, yeah, yes, Israel. Israel, who stones the prophets that I send to you. You're just the New Testament Israel. Every time I tried gathering you like a chicken gathers her little, little chicks, a hen gathers her chicks, you, you, you came and you stoned the prophets. The messengers that I sent to you, you abused. See, so we have to realize that those that are in our lives as voices are not common and they're not people that we can just beat up. Because as you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. What about as you've done to your leaders? Spiritual fathers and mothers. Are you guys catching this? It's a two-way street. But ultimately, the student is the one reaping all the blessings. And the father or the mother is interested in extending the lineage of legacy. Discipleship. Okay, let's, let's keep moving here. Oh yeah, here's a great one. Just because that person's number is in your phone or you are friends on social media does not mean you're being discipled. Just because you sowed into their ministry does not mean you're being discipled. Well, we're actually connected with that ministry. How? Um, we go to their meetings. Okay, so you ate loaves and fishes. Okay, what's next? Well, we sow and we're, we're financial partners. Okay, so was Judas. He was a financial partner. How are you being discipled by these people? Because the only way that you can truly prove, because look, you can go to meetings, you can even walk up to people like David Hogan and, and Big Deal, or Brother Don, Pastor Don, everyone loves Pastor Don, he's awesome, right? And he comes into the church, and you get him to say something nice to you, or you comment on their Facebook page, and they say a very nice reply. Oh, I'm being, I'm being discipled, are you? Okay, none of that stuff actually qualifies you being a disciple, none of it. 
What qualifies you being a disciple is someone that actually steps out and was willing to confront your stronghold. That's how you know love is flowing. What you do with that is completely dependent on if it's going to become a lifelong relationship or if it's going to be that one time they took a risk. Hello? So if you say you're discipled, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Because if you're without chastening, further down, if you're without chastening, you are not sons but orphans. Or in the King James, bastards. So literally, you call yourself a son, but you have the language of an orphan. Hello? Because you have knowledge, it's a substitute that you can work your way around the room and even be seen as someone that can... Here's, here's, Here's the deal. Here's the deal. Listen to me what I'm about to say to you. If someone's trying to speak into your life, ask them this. And I don't care how well you know them. You need to ask them. Even me. You can even ask this to me. If someone's trying to speak into your life, you look at them and you say, I want to know if you're going to be speaking into my life and correcting me and pouring into me, who corrects you? Because I've seen a lot of people that are in the scene of being something in ministry and yet no one has that regular insight to see what's going on. No one has the voice to correct. And yet they then posture to speak into everyone else's life. That's, called, that's what Jesus said was the blind leading the blind. How can you take me somewhere that you haven't been? How, are you catching this? See, so, so if, if, if I have an orphan that's trying to be a father, I have an orphan that will ultimately become a tyrant and that's made his identity and being the very thing that he never had, but he doesn't know what it looks like because he never had it, so he becomes something else. Are you catching this? He doesn't know what he or she don't know what you need because they never got it themselves. So what are you really getting? You'll get maybe someone that's, you'll get one of two things. You'll get someone that's really nice to you all the time and everything's just praise the Lord and blessings, or you'll get a crazy tyrant. You catching this? Someone getting this? See, my heart, my heart, Pastor Bex's heart, our heart is that every person in this house steps into measures of true discipleship. Because it, just imagine, I want to dream with you for a second. What does it look like for every person in this church to become truly discipled? What is the potent potential of this house? It looks like Matthew 28. We've got too many churches in the world where the front leadership team is the only ones that somewhat being discipled. What about the rest of the house? When Matthew 28 literally says, make disciples of all people. Now, here's the thing. You don't just sit back and wait for someone to disciple you. You start pursuing. Hello? Got to be a two-way street. I can't cover everything today because it's already three o'clock and I need to land, but this here needs to be one of the main pursuits of your life. If you've never had this, if you've never ever been corrected or you've always just, I'm in church, but you know, yay, and that sounds scary and I don't know about this, read the Bible and tell me what else Jesus told people to do. Make disciples and get souls saved and make those souls saved become disciples and get them to get people saved. Right? And in the midst of that, there's miracles, signs and wonders and beautiful stories of redemption and breakthrough and provision. And That's why if a, if a denomination just gets into prosperity and they forget all the other stuff, where's the discipleship? We've lost the mission. The mission is discipleship. Someone catching this? Here's a statement I'll say, and there's so much that I can't say right now because of time. A lot of the time, especially if you've had wounds growing up in home where mum and dad was maybe absent, abusive, indifferent, maybe you had interesting cultures in church, maybe you had bad examples of spiritual health, whatever that looks like, you can have a level of apprehension and you can see uh, spiritual leaders, especially people like me that can be very alpha in culture, very apostolic, very black and white, yes and no, right, as a threat. But here's the thing. 
A spiritual father and mother is not a referee. That's just telling you when you go out of bounds. Please listen to this. A spiritual father and mother is not just a referee to tell you when you're going in and out of bounds or how to judge certain things that's happened on the field. A spiritual father or mother is a coach to teach you how to not get into out of bounds. Catch the difference. One is a penalty oriented and the other one is a mentoring, hey, this is what you need to do. Hey, watch it, you're, going, you, you, you're, you're on a bad track here. We need to bring you back around. Hey, you've got all this potential. I see you in this position, but I actually think you're going to be much better than that. You're like, I don't agree with that. Actually, I've got better perspective because I'm seeing the big picture. That's why God's given me an oversight, insight. There's, this, there's something on the inside of you that maybe you haven't even seen yet, and I just really feel like God's wanting to grow it. See, for me personally, I've had people do that to me before where I'll tell them, like, hey, I see this on your life, and they're like, I totally disagree. My voice stops right there. My voice cannot speak. You guys, you guys following this? So the way you steward those moments where people step out is the way that you are either inviting more voice or less voice. And here's the thing. It's okay if you don't understand, but just work on not pushing back and saying, can you please explain? I'm trying to understand, but I don't get it yet. Could you please explain that to me? I might need to sit down over a coffee. Can I take you out for a coffee? I just want to hear your heart on this. Even if it hurts, especially if it's hurting. You catching this? So they're not a referee, they're a coach. Stop treating them like a referee that's kind of biased to the other team. I like, you catching this? Well, if I do that, they're not really for me and they're just trying to keep, no, they're not. That's not true at all. There's no one prouder. There's the Olympics happening right now, right? Pray for China. Um, the, <laughs> there's the Olympics happening right now, and I guarantee you, aside from mum and dad, there's no one prouder when that person crosses the first place than the coach all that time. And, and, and how many people, how many athletes go, I just want to thank my coach. Because my coach, my mum and dad bought me, they, they funded me or they helped me, or maybe they weren't there or whatever, but the coach was the one that had all the commitment into your success. We need to start valuing that because those athletes, none of them got there. They might have been born with great genes and gifts, but none of them got there without the discipline of a coach. You need a coach. You need someone that's brave enough to confront your faults and encourage your strengths and love you still. Okay, but you're going to have to choose to get vulnerable instead of putting your makeup on over your, over your wrinkles. Otherwise, all you're doing is wasting your time and pretending that you're something else. Transrealism. <laughs> blessed. Well, it's not blessed, but... Okay, I'm going I'm to finish with this. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. I'm going to prove everything I've just said to you. Because... If you're used to the Bless Me Club Christianity, what I've just said is going to sound very negative and it's going to sound very heavy, but it's not. And we actually had totally a divine appointment today in worship, which I wasn't aware of, which also validates what we're saying. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus was right in the middle of his ministry. He said, then, the disciple, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, stop, pause. It's the same exact language he said to the disciples down by the fishing boats. Catch this. If anyone desires to come after me. See, Jesus needed them to work alongside him. When it was time to hand out loaves and fishes, guess who was doing it? It was the disciples. They weren't, they weren't having their robes on with little deacon brother Paul and, well, not Paul, but uh, John or Matthew, right? Little, you know, we better just give some credit. No, they were, just, they were just his apprentices. And they learned by working in proximity with Jesus. And in working in proximity, they were able to interpret his heart for people, his culture, the way he assessed situations, the way he dealt with conflict, the way he dealt with all kinds of accusations. And, you know, Jesus was perfect. You're not going to find another perfect pastor. 
You're not going to find another perfect spiritual father or mother, okay? But working in proximity helps you get what they've received over a lifetime. It's still going to be in process, but it's going to bring you closer to healthy. Are you catching this? So watch this. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. What? I thought this was like American Idol where I was going to get recognized. (laughs) Nope. The part of you that doesn't need to be recognized needs to be denied. And actually, so Jesus is just literally putting a massive line in the sand saying, if you want to get in on this, firstly, you've got to die. Who's in? (laughs) Judas is like, let me go count the money for a second. I'll I'll be right back. All right? Let him deny himself, take up his own cross. Don't just help me carry mine. You have to carry yours and be invested to the end. And follow me. Jesus is putting such a strong line in the sand that you are either serious about being in or you're a faker and leaving right now. Don't expect it to be any different today. We have a high standard to follow. His name's Jesus. I need to disciple people like Jesus did. And sometimes that looks like, get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. Jesus actually said that in his discipleship course. Can you imagine? (laughs) Peter's like, what? Yeah, you're literally housing the devil right now and I don't want him to have a voice, so I'm going to rebuke it. That's so unkind. But then in the same context, I want you guys to catch this because we try and find the path of least resistance. But the path of least resistance is the 5,000 and it produces the lowest level of lifetime achievement. If you truly want to have a life that realizes why you were made by God and your calling, get as close to the coalface as you can. Let it get raw. Invite it in. Invite those people to have voices in your life that go straight to the core. It's not going to happen right away. They're going to test you to see if you're able to steward it. Because discipleship is this long life process. Even when you start in ministry, whatever that's supposed to mean, you're going to need those voices. And here's the thing, guys. You don't just become someone that invites voices once you're in ministry. You needed to have it when no one ever knew your name. Guys, listen to me. If you think, well, you know, God's called me to be a multimillionaire to fund the kingdom. Okay, how are you stewarding funds now? Oh, we've kind of got debts everywhere, and we're just like broke, and we like spend every dollar that we get before, you know, we're cashing in checks before we get even get checks. Like, dude, you ain't ever going to become a millionaire. Start stewarding it right today. You're not going to change if you win the lottery. You're going to stay exactly the same in two years. You've lost it all because you're stewarding a culture now. So invite voices in. I don't ever, like I'm happy if this is what we look like for the rest of our lives, I'm happy. But I don't ever, I would never want to be someone that's on stadiums in front of all kinds of people. And, And I know of some people right now that you think are the most amazing people in the world. I know of some people right now that their lives are shipwrecks. No one knows about it in public. Their lives are complete shipwrecks because they got so powerful and they never kept the voices in because they outgrew them. Hello? You don't outgrow someone's wisdom. Even if your platform's higher than theirs, Mr. Miyagi still got something to say. (laughs) Daniel-san. Right? See, I need that voice even if I have to purposely submit myself to it so that I always stay small in my own eyes. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. We're going to pray over this because I just really feel that for some of us, this might be new. For some of us, this might have been areas that we've contemplated or areas that we just feel like, you know what? I've just felt like an orphan most of my life and, and this is a scary topic for me, but I know I need this. I've done discipleship before, but I did it on my own terms. We're going to pray right now and we're going to ask God to help us cross lines in our own hearts that we would start to pull and we would start moving ourselves and positioning ourselves to have those voices in our lives. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are just teaching us about how to navigate life in your kingdom. And God, we just really see that discipleship is so important to you. And we're asking you, God, 
that you would help every single person here in this room and watching online to be able to start drilling down in our hearts and really allowing Holy Spirit to uncover areas in our lives that have kept us out of these relationships or areas that we've walked in dishonor and it's caused those voices to not have access. And we're just asking God that you would give us the courage and the bravery by your Spirit and just the opportunity and the wisdom how to step into levels of proximity and be mentored and discipled so that we each would come into our calling, that we each would actually be stewarded and counseled and advised out of brokenness and immaturity and just not knowing things, God, and that you would help us lose all the things of us, the denying ourselves, the taking up our cross, that we would look more like Jesus and that we would ultimately, each of us, be able to come into our callings and the various ministries and gifts that you have for us to operate in the body so that the kingdom would have legacy. God, we ask for opportunity. We ask that you would change our heart, that when we're confronted, God, that you would give us the grace just to sit and not fight and argue and debacle, but that you would give us the wisdom to go and pray about it and have you show us how to steward those things. And, and in the areas where it's wrong, God, and it's hitting a nerve, that you would just give us grace, God, on how to receive correction with dignity. And that we would not just walk through correction and try and make it out the other side, but that you would help us to be corrected in a way that we put it into action and bring about true change by your Spirit so that we can grow and not just be agitated. In Jesus' name, Father, I thank you that this is a kingdom discipleship house and that you are growing sons and daughters in this house and not just members. So we thank you, God, and we bless you, and we thank you that this year is going to be the year of establishing of sons and daughters in this house. In Jesus' name, amen.